in the book of Nehemiah today. Nehemiah chapter 13, starting a three-session Easter series next week on Palm Sunday, then Good Friday, then Easter Sunday, and then our first Peter series after that. But we're going to finish off this book. As you find Nehemiah 13, let me pray, then we'll start walking through it together. Father, thank you for your grace, uh, your favor, um, just the sweetness of being able to participate, partner in the gospel um, with one another and, and with you by way of your spirit working in us, by way of your word directing us. And I thank you for the good things that have gone on even over the last week or two here. And, and we do pray, looking forward ahead to the Easter season especially. Uh, we pray that this would be a sweet time of ministry, a, a time where we would see people who don't know you coming to know you. Um, for those that do know you, growing in their knowledge of you, we pray for those getting baptized, that you would protect their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, the enemy loves to attack and, and snatch good things away, and so I pray against the enemy. I, I pray against fear and and doubt and, and discouragement that sometimes can happen, um, especially with those getting baptized as they get closer to the date. So I, I pray for them. Uh, we pray for them together. And now guide us as we finish off this study today. Um, guide us by way of your spirit as we look at your word in Jesus' name. Amen. If uh, Nehemiah the book of Nehemiah, if Nehemiah was made into a movie, it would have ended in chapter 12. Um, chapter 12 was a culmination, right? I mean, it would have been a perfect ending, a culmination of so much good that's gone on. Uh, we partied last week in chapter 12. There was this this great coming together, celebrating not only the, the rebuilding of the ruins that that was Jerusalem, the walls and the homes specifically, and then the temple before that. But more importantly and sig significantly, the, the rebuilding of a people uh, now in right relationship with God. That's where the movie should have ended. Chapter 12, the end, roll the credits. Great, great time last week. But it doesn't end there. It ends with chapter 13, and that kind of sucks, just to be honest with you. Because chapter 13 is not full of things like that, as we will see. It's just the opposite. Speaking of movies, one of my favorite movies growing up um, was The Karate Kid. Anybody? Karate Kid? This is going back a ways, right? Grandpa Funk talking about the, <laughs> the talkies that he used to, used to watch. Anyways, Karate Kid loved it, saw it many times. Um, perfect ending to that movie. Perfect ending. But, perfect ending. Daniel, Ralph Macchio, remember at the end of, of Karate Kid pulls out the crane method? That he, remember the crane method that he learned from Mr. Miyagi, his sensei? And he brings it out and he, and he destroys, he levels Johnny Lawrence. Remember Johnny Lawrence, the blonde kid from, from Cobra Kai? Levels him. That's the end of the movie with, with Elizabeth Shue, who played Allie in Karate Kid, whom I had a crush on all through college. <laughs> I'm not alone, you know what I'm talking about. She brings out the trophy, hands it to Daniel, Mr. Miyagi's there, crowd's going crazy, the end. That's how it ended, it's a great ending. If you went to Karate Kid back in the day in the theater, you walked out of the theater just wanting to kick something, you were so fired up. <laughs> but what if it didn't end that way? What, what, what if it didn't end with Daniel winning, but Daniel getting disqualified because the crane method was deemed illegal? What if that happened? And, and so Daniel didn't win the, the All-Valley Karate Championship. Johnny did because Daniel was disqualified. And because of that, Allie doesn't want to hang around with a loser. She goes back to Johnny. What if that happened? And what if Mr. Miyagi was so despondent for giving Daniel an illegal move that he was beside himself with, with despondency, walking out to the parking lot and getting beat up by Kreese, the other sensei from Cobra Kai? What if that happened? <laughs> what if that was the ending of Karate Kid? That's Nehemiah 13. That's how Nehemiah ends. It should have ended in chapter 12, 
But it ends with chapter 13, and like I said, it kind of sucks. Let's set the stage. Put your eyes down in verse 6 and the first part of verse 7. I am the only person, by the way, who has ever lived who has connected Nehemiah 13 with Karate Kid, just so you know. <laughs> and so that's a, that's a win. That's a big win for me. Verse 6, we read, while all this was happening, I'll, uh, we'll figure that out in a minute, what this happening was. While, while all this was happening, I was not in Jerusalem because I had returned to King Art, Art, Artaxerxes of Babylon in the 32nd year of his reign. It was only later that I asked the king for a leave of absence so I could return to Jerusalem. Let's just stop there. Let's do some math together. When doing the math, what we can figure out, if you go all the way back to chapter 1, now to chapter 13, is that Nehemiah had been in Jerusalem for 12 years, overseeing the rebuilding of the walls and the homes. In addition, he served as the governor of the region. However, that wasn't his main gig. His main gig was working for the king of Persia, King Artaxerxes, as a cupbearer, and back in chapter 1, he had asked for a leave of absence so he could go to Jerusalem and help with the rebuilding project, but he had promised to return to him, which is what happens between chapter 12 and 13. We don't know how long he's been gone for. We just know that he asked for a second chance to go back to Jerusalem to see how things were. So we don't know how long uh, the period of time is between the two chapters. We just know that when he arrives, when he returns to Jerusalem, things aren't good. And what chapter 13 does is it records a handful of things that Nehemiah finds that have arisen in his absence. The first, if you like taking notes, is legalism. Let me read verses 1 to 3. At that time, the book of Moses was read publicly to the people. The command was found written in it that no Ammonite or Moabite, keep those two groups in mind, should ever enter the assembly of God because they did not meet the Israelites with food and water. Instead, they hired Balaam against them to curse them, but our God turned the curse into a blessing. That's a reference to something that you can read about in Numbers 22 and following. I'll leave that to your own study. Verse 3, when they, that's the Israelites, heard the law, that law is recorded in Deuteronomy. Um, well, I'll, I'll show you where, uh, or let you know where, Deuteronomy 23, 3 to 5. The law that the Ammonite and the Moabite can't come into the household of God. When they heard that law, they separated all those of mixed descent from Israel. So what they had read from the book of the law, and remember, that's what they've been doing over the last month, right? At least, or at least previously to chapter 13, they've been spending time reading the book of the law, the law of Moses. They had come across a text in Deuteronomy 23 that said that no no Ammonite, no Moabite was allowed to enter the the assembly of God, but the, the people decide to take it up a notch and exclude everyone from mixed descent from Israel. That was not commanded. And it was never God's intent. The people were to be a light to the nations, and foreigners who put their faith in Israel's God were grafted in to Israel. People like who? People like Ruth. Remember Ruth? Read the book of Ruth. Rahab, the prostitute who helped the spies, people like that, Ruth and Rahab. Remember who Ruth was? She was a Moabite, of all things. A Moabite who married a kinsman redeemer. His name was Boaz. They had a kid. His name was Obed. Obed had a kid. His name was Jesse. Jesse had a kid, his name was David, King David, through which that kingly line, the Messiah, would come. If you ever read the genealogy of Jesus recorded in Matthew 1, you will read the names Ruth and Rahab there. Two major problems with legalism. One, it seeks to make us more holy than God. 
usually focusing on things that we shouldn't do. Many Christians live their lives like this, totally focused on things they shouldn't do. So for example, going forward to the time of Jesus, we have the command to keep the Sabbath. The Pharisees hear that. And they said, well, we have to make sure that we don't break the Sabbath. So they created 39 separate categories of what entailed work with many subcategories under those 39 categories. Literally, there were thousands of rules connected to the Sabbath down to details like how many steps you could take on on the Sabbath to how many letters you could write on the Sabbath. The problem is, when we become so concerned with what we can't do, we end up doing no good either. Which was the case with the Pharisees, who had deemed it illegal to even heal on the Sabbath. Jesus changed that and essentially said to them, saying to us as well, it's always good to do good. The second problem with legalism is that it keeps us from people and keeps people from God, which, like this law in verse 3 of Nehemiah 13, would have kept people like Ruth and Rahab from God. I've had um, what I would call two mentors in ministry. My first mentor was a guy I met who was the camp director of the camp I was working at. I thought I was gonna get, get into camp ministry as a vocation. He was a, a big part of my, my early, early life in ministry. And then my second uh, was a pastor that I worked for when I started working in the church. A uh, great man, learned so much from him. Uh, he has since passed. I only had to rebuke him one time. And my rebuke of this, this mentor of mine came when he told me that he had built a relationship with a non-Christian, good relationship, and in one day, uh, this, this person who he had built this relationship with wanted to meet with him and suggested that they meet at a, at a casino nearby the church where my men- mentor worked, in, in a restaurant within the casino. Wanted to meet, just talk, catch up, had some questions for him. My mentor said he couldn't meet there for risk of being seen in the casino. I rebuked him. And I said to him that in the same way Jesus risked being defined as a glutton and a drunkard for the sake of the lost, he should have risked being defined and categorized as a gambler for the same reason. Legalism keeps us from people and people from God which is never God's intent. That's the first thing that stands out, legalism. The second thing that stands out, and I'm borrowing this title, not the guts after it, but the title itself is nepotism. Take a look at verses four to nine. Now before this, the priest, Eliashib, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was a relative of Tobiah and had prepared a large room for him where they had previously stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles of the tenths of grain, new wine and fresh oil prescribed for the Levite singers and gatekeepers, along with the contributions for the priests. While, here's the verse we read already, while all this was happening, I was not in Jerusalem because I had returned to King Artaxerxes of Babylon in the 32nd year of his reign. I was only later, it was only later that I asked the king for a leave of absence so I could return to Jerusalem. Then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done on behalf of Tobiah by providing him a room in the courts of God's house. I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobiah's household possessions out of the room. I ordered that the room be purified and I had the articles of the house of God restored there along with the grain offerings and frankincense. I also found found out that because the portions for the Levites had not been given, each of the Levites, uh, actually, let me stop there. I'm getting ahead of myself. So nepotism. So what's going on? Well, we have a priest. His name is Eliashib. And he has been given uh, the orders by Nehemiah before Nehemiah le- left to go back to Susa to be in charge of the storerooms within, within the temple. Eliashib has a relative. His name's Tobiah. 
And he had given Tobiah a room in the house of God to crash in, to call home. Who's Tobiah? We know Tobiah. We've met him before. Hang a left. Go all the way back to chapter 2. We met him there first in verse 10. When Sanballat, so this is Nehemiah 2.10, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, wait a second. We've read about Ammon. I mean, the people of God said, not only, not only will these two people groups, like the Ammonites, not be permitted in the house of God. Nobody is. But now Tobiah is an Ammonite. But not only that, he's a jerk. Right? Remember verse 10? Look, continue. Uh, the Ammonite official heard that someone had come to pursue the prosperity of the Israelites. They were greatly displeased. Drop down to verse 19. When Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard about this, they mocked and despised us and said, what is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Tobiah was the guy who said, even if you build the walls, if a fox walks along the walls, they'll crumble. That's Tobiah. He's a mocker. He's an Ammonite. He's greatly displeased at this has gone on the rebuilding. Take a look at verse, verses 7 and 8 in chapter 4. When Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arab, Ammonite, Arabs, Ammonites, and Ashdodites heard that the repair to the walls of Jerusalem was progressing and that the gaps were being closed, they became furious. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw it into confusion. Chapter 13. But now, here he is, Eliashib, the priest of all people, in great hypocrisy, turning away the nations from the, from the temple, is now saying to his relative Tobiah, the enemy, the mocker, the Ammonite, hey, stay here. What the heck? So it's understandable when Nehemiah finds out that he's, he's beside himself, and I'm, I'm sure for a number of reasons. Obviously because of Tobiah's past, but also the concession, the concession against the clear mandate of the scriptures, obviously upset, understandably so, of the priest. I mean, have a backbone, man. Be faithful. What great hypocrisy. And, and what was Tobiah's end game? Was he going to destroy the, the place? What was he going to do? Were the people protected? I mean, as far as the priest goes, show some wisdom, show some fortitude, show some faithfulness, and be willing to make the hard call, even with a relative. Because sometimes commitment to God's family calls us to make hard decisions with our earthly ones. Doesn't it? The third thing that had arisen. So we got legalism, we've got nepotism. The third is secularism. Verses 10 to 14. I also found out that because the portions for the Levites had not been given, each of the Levites and the singers performing the service had gone back to his own field. Therefore, I rebuked the officials asking, why has the house of God been neglected? I gathered the Levites and singers together and stationed them at their posts. Then all Ju Judah brought a tenth of the grain, new wine, and fresh oil into the storehouses. I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses the priest uh, Shelemiah, the, the scribe Zadok, and Padiah of the Levites with Hanan, son of Zachar, son of Mataniah, to assist them because they were considered trustworthy. They were responsible for the distribution to their colleagues. Remember me for this, my God, and don't erase the deeds of faithful love I have done for the house of my God and for its services. Stop there. Back in chapter 10, that chapter of vows, uh, they had vowed, this group, the nation of Israel, had vowed to not neglect the house of God. They had vowed that. We're not going to neglect the house of God. And last week in chapter 12, they, they, they donated. They made good on their word. They took care of the priests, Levites, and singers. But now, in chapter 13, Nehemiah finds total neglect, so much so that the priests, the Levites, and the singers 
had to leave their ministry positions and gone back necessarily to work their own fields because, doggone it, they needed to eat. And nobody was giving to the temple ministry. Nehemiah asks in verse 11, why has the house of God been neglected? What's the issue in all of this? Well, one, God had ordained that the temple be the place where he met his people and they were made right with him. And he had specified very specifically that the, that the priests who came from the line of Aaron, they must come from the line of Aaron, and the Levites who came from the, land, uh, from the tribe of Levi were to carry out the duties of, of purification and sacrifice. No one else could. The singers were to oversee the worship ministry within the temple as David, King David, and Asaph had prescribed. But to do this well, Levites, singers, priests, and so on, for them to do this well and to the utmost, the people were to support them through their supplies and their contributions and their tithes and their gifts and so on, so they wouldn't have to work elsewhere. And and we read last week, as I just mentioned, that that's what they did because we read there in chapter 12 that Judah, the region of Judah, was grateful to the priests and Levites and the singers, but that now has stopped. Chapter 12, chapter 13, now stopped. Obviously, there is a connection today to what churches do for their staff and the costs associated with ministry. I, for the past 28 years, I've been the benefactor of people's giving to the local church. I, I, have, re, I have relied on people's contributions for the last 28 years. Jesus affirms this practice when saying that the workman deserves his wages, and Paul writes that we shouldn't muzzle the ox while he's treading the grain, meaning the ox deserves to eat while he's working. I'm the ox in, in, that, in that illustration. It, in other words, it's okay to make a living off the gospel. And as a community, as if you were, if you were with us uh, last Sunday for our lunch, you, you do that. As a community, you do that. And, he, and you are generous, and for that I'm extremely thankful. What, what I want to consider for a couple minutes is why do we stop giving? Like, what takes us from being chapter 12 people to chapter 13 people? What happens? And if you consider yourself a chapter 12 person, what do you need to be aware of so you don't become a chapter 13 person? So, so what happens? Let me give you some reasons why people stop giving or don't give in the first place. The first is debt. Research shows that a, a major reason why people don't give is debt, which is understandable. I mean, if you're carrying a lot of debt, bills are coming in, co collectors are calling, and, and every extra uh, dollar left over needs to service that debt. It's, it's really tough to get motivated to give the average person, the, the, every person who lives in Vancouver, the average debt is $21,929 per person, not including mortgage. Uh, in 2019, in Canada, credit card balances, when you bring all of the credit card debt together, exceeded $100 billion for the first time. Every dollar that is increasing, for every dollar that is spent, 97 cents is used to pay that debt off, so it's increasing. Good to be a credit card company, by the way. You get 19.9% .9 return on $100 billion. It's, it's good to be a credit card company. So debt. Fear is a big one, too. The opposite of fear is faith. And many live in fear, thinking it all depends on them instead of trusting in the promises of God. And so to counter that fear, we do all we can to make sure that, that our storerooms are full, which means giving and generosity are curtailed. In, in contrast, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
It was the fool, Jesus said, who had full barns on the day of his reckoning. Greed, too, is another reason. Paul writes, how serious is greed? Well, Paul writes that the greedy won't inherit the kingdom of heaven. Because greed is synonymous with idolatry. It is the worship of idols. This is why Jesus warns us in Luke 12 to watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not the abundance of his possessions. And the last that keeps us from giving or moves us from 12 to 13 is pride. Pride that comes in thinking that we are the source of our money. Pride that comes with having money in the first place and all the toys and trinkets and bling that comes with it. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy, if you've ever read it and studied it, is Moses' farewell address to the people of Israel. He's not going into the promised land with them, and so he wants to give them some last-minute pieces of advice. That's the whole book. In Deuteronomy 8, he writes this. <clears throat> Be careful that your heart doesn't become proud and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions, a thirsty land where there was no water. He brought water out of Flint Rock for you. He fed you in the wilderness with manna which your ancestors had not known in order to humble you and test you so that in the end he might cause you to, cause you to prosper. Okay, here, you're going to prosper. Here's the warning. Here's the warning. You, you may say to yourself, my power and my own ability have gained this wealth for me, but remember that the Lord your God gives you the power to gain wealth. Is it wrong to have money? No, to, to quote from, from one I respect greatly, it's, it's wrong to keep it and hoard it and not be ready to share it and to, to rest your hopes on it. There will be the rich in the church and, and God gives us things to enjoy, but we must always keep in mind that there is nothing we have that hasn't been given to us. Paul asks rhetorically, what do you have that you have not been given? Why are you acting, he says to us, like it wasn't given to you. All we have comes by grace, and we need to be people of grace, which is why Paul calls giving a ministry of grace. I've said this a billion times in my life. The, cu the currency in God's kingdom, and I borrow this idea as well, the currency in God's kingdom is grace. That's what we spend. We receive grace, we give grace. Everything we have is grace. We are to be conduits of grace, go-betweens. That's why, again, Paul calls giving a ministry of grace. Why do I call this point secularism, though? Well, because the word secular comes from the Latin, means literally the world. And when our relationship with the world becomes most important, the ministry of the kingdom will lessen and our money will follow. This is what took the people from chapter 12 to chapter 13. Tied to this is the next thing that Nehemiah discovers upon his return to Jerusalem, and that is materialism. Let me read verses 15 to 22. At that time, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath. They were also bringing in stores of grain and loading them on donkeys along with wine, grapes, and figs. All kinds of goods were being brought to Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So I warned them against selling food on that day. The Tyrians living there were importing fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil you are doing profaning the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same so that our God brought all this disaster on us and on this city? And now you are rekindling anger against Israel by profaning the Sabbath. 
When shadows began to fall in the city gates of Jerusalem, just before the Sabbath, I gave orders that the city gates be closed and not open until after the Sabbath. I posted some of my men at the gates so that no goods could enter during the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and, and those who sell all kinds of goods camped outside Jerusalem, but I warned them, why are you camping in front of the wall? If you do it again, I'll use force against you. After that, they did not come again on the Sabbath. Then I instructed the Levites to purify themselves and guard the city gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, my God, and look on me with compassion according to the abundance of your faithful love. Exactly. <laughs> this is... <laughs> this is um, simply what we just read here. This is simply profit over purity. And we are called to the opposite. Practically speaking, what does this mean? Well, it's tax season. And so that means that we, as followers of Jesus, render to Caesar what is Caesar's even though it's so tempting not to. <laughs> right? Fudge a little bit here. It also means that when it comes to the marketplace, that we treat our clients and customers and staff and bosses like Jesus calls us to. It also means that we remember that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And, and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. It, it was the deceitfulness of riches in the third soil that, that choked out the seed of the gospel in that parable of Jesus of the soils and the seed. And, and it also means that unlike Nehemiah 13 and the people in it, we take a break. We take a day off. We, we, we rest. Work is good. Workaholism is not. God has called us to work. It's a good thing. But God has not called us to work like it all depends on us. What this also could mean is you don't take the promotion or the new job because of what it will mean to you or your relationships, familial, friendships, your relationship with Jesus most of all. Something to think about. Profit over purity, purity over profit. So we've had legalism, we've had nepotism, we've had materialism, we've had, or excuse me, secularism and materialism. We, we end with one more. Nehemiah, on his return, discovered King Solomonism. It's not a word unless you right-click it, add it to the dictionary, now it is a word. Let me read the last part of chapter 13, starting at verse 23. In those days I also saw Jews who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Isn't that brutal? There they are again. Ammon and Moab. They wouldn't let anybody in, but oh yeah, now they're marrying them, and they're housing them in the temple. Bad news, man. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples but could not speak Hebrew. Couldn't speak their own language. I rebuked them, cursed them, beat some of their men, and pulled out their hair. It's awesome. It's unbelievable. Nehemiah, man. Goes all Will Smith on them. <laughs> I forced them to take an oath before God and said, you must not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters as wives for your sons or yourselves. Didn't King Solomon, there he is, of Israel sin in matters like this? There is not a king like him among many nations. He was loved by his God and God made him king over all Israel. Yet foreign women drew him into sin. Why then should we hear about you doing all this terrible evil and acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women? Even one of the sons of Jehodiah, son of the high priest Eliashib, had become a son-in-law to Sambalat, Sambalat the Horonite. 
You get in the picture that Eliashib isn't much of a priest, priest in name only. So I drove him away from me. Remember them, my God, for defiling the priesthood as well as the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. So I purified them from everything foreign and assigned specific duties to each of the priests and Levites. I also arranged for the donation of wood at the appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, my God, with favor. We talked about this a couple Sundays ago, going all the way back to chapter 10, where they made the vow, we're not going to give our daughters to foreign men, we're not going to have our sons marry foreign women. Now this, chapter 13. This isn't ethnic cleansing, as we talked about. This isn't racial superiority. This is a call to spiritual purity. God had set aside a people for a purpose. Today, the issue isn't people marrying people from different nations and and languages and ethnicities. That's beautiful. That's the beautiful mosaic that is the kingdom of God. Today, it's making sure people who love Jesus marry people who love Jesus. So as to do all you can to not be drawn away from Jesus. Because a a major concession like that can lead to so many smaller ones. And before you know it, the testimony of Solomon is your testimony too. Drawn into sin. Walking away from Jesus. But additionally, people who love Jesus should marry people who love Jesus so they can create a home where the language spoken is the shared language of faith in Jesus so that their children won't speak an altogether different one. For few things are sadder than our kids not speaking the language of faith in Jesus, right? So here's my warning. If you love Jesus and you're single and and don't marry someone who loves Jesus as well, I'll curse you and pull your hair out. Because I got a verse. Nehemiah, man. What is going on with that cowboy? And with that, Midtown, that's the book of Nehemiah, the end. It's crazy. It ends with legalism, nepotism, secularism, materialism, and King Solomonism. And it seems with Nehemiah feeling very sorry for himself. What a bad ending. Leaves you with a bad taste in your mouth. Even though, yes, Nehemiah came back and he did correct things. You can go, look, look, Norm, this is what was going on. He corrected it. But don't you get the sense it's only a matter of time? And if you've read the book of Malachi, you know it's true. And it's a bummer because think of all the good things that we've learned over the last three months. That we should be people quick to pray like Nehemiah was. And planning is okay too. Nehemiah was a prayerful planner. We learned that. And we learned that we should be ready to go when God calls us to go and that God's not hesitant calling us away from cushy things jobs to other parts of the city or perhaps to other parts of the world. But if we go, even though it's God's call, we learn that we should expect opposition. But we learn we fight that opposition and can fight that opposition. We learn that we fight it by prayer and by carrying the sword in our belts. Remember that? And we fight it together. We need each other. We're to stand together with one another. We can't fight alone. That's who we are. We need the community Who else are we? We're diverse, but called to unity and partnership, all working together for the sake of the building and populating of the new Jerusalem. That's our mission. We also learn that we are to be people of the word who read it and share it and explain it and do it and and rejoice over it by what we discover in it. And and yes, there, there will be times of confession and repentance. There will be times of mourning, but not all the time. For we are to be be a people who party well, celebrate well. Thanks should be often coming 
off our lips. We also learn that we are to be people of purity. We're to be people of, of generosity. We learned all of that over the last three months. But most of all, what we learned is what we learned about God, that he is faithful and sovereign and gracious and long-suffering and grants favor and success for his name and our good. We learned all of that over the last 12 chapters. Should have ended in chapter 12. But it ends with chapter 13. But you know what? I'm glad it does. For although this is the end of the book of Nehemiah, it's not the end of the story. As bad as this ends, it reminds us that Nehemiah isn't the crescendo of God's story. Jesus is. The cross is. The empty tomb is. A, a living Savior who now reigns at the right hand of the Father, supreme over all things. It also reminds us that there will be a never-ending battle on this side of heaven. The flesh opposing the Spirit, tempting us to return to what we only just repented and vowed never to do again. How was your week? Any repenting, vow, vow taking, only to return? We're reminded in this of that never-ending battle, a battle that won't end until we enter the better city that Jesus is now building for us. And finally, as we close this book, we are reminded by the way this book ends that our security isn't based, it can't be based on the vows we make, but the blood that was spilt. And our protection doesn't come by the walls we build, but by the Spirit who seals until the day of Christ Jesus. That's not how Nehemiah ends, but Midtown, that's how this, this book ends, and that's the best of all endings. Would you rise as we go into a time of response? Let's pray together. Father, I'm so thankful for your word. Thankful for the book of Nehemiah, and yes, I thank you that the book ends this way. I thank you that it ends this way because it reminds us of what you accomplished through the sending of your son, Jesus, who did what we can't do, weakened by the flesh as we are. And I thank you that we have been purchased, blood-bought, secure in you, and that the worst that this world can give is death, but for us, it leads to better by far. I thank you. I thank you for the protection of the Holy Spirit, the sealing, guaranteeing work of the Holy Spirit. We just, we're so full of joy and thanks. And now as we come and remember what has been accomplished for us by way of Jesus through the meal that Jesus, your son, ordained and has given to us, Oh, we want to do it with worship, our hearts full of worship. And I pray for those who have had hard weeks, maybe weeks where, yeah, they went quickly to chapter 13, even though they've made vows in the past and repented in the past. I pray that they would receive grace upon grace today. Knowing, believing, knowing and believing that you don't respond to our weaknesses with anger but with sympathy, and you don't break bruised reeds and snuff out smoldering wicks. So I pray they come back to you. Be restored this morning uh, uh, and, and strengthened to go back into, into the weeks ahead. And I pray for these things. In Jesus, your great name, amen.